Hey everybody, it's Ryan. Uh, thanks for downloading today's show. And just a reminder, as always, Wake Up War Chan is brought to you by our friends at For the Table, Madison Social, Central and Township in the heart of College Town. Ladies and gentlemen, from Tallahassee to Thomasville, and from coast to Atlantic coast, it's time to wake up watching here on 97.9 ESPN Radio, and it's a very happy Wednesday, August 30th, to you and yours. You're currently listening to the voice of Ryan Kelly. I'm the director of digital media at Warchant.com. Drew Hickens on the other side of the glass, pushing the button, sliding the sliders, and making things work. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. I'm I'm ready, ready to go, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just football season or stuff like that. This is the easiest it's been for me to wake up at 5 and go into the station in a very, very long time. That's not to say I don't love doing the show, but, I mean, getting up at 5 is getting up at 5. And, and I and listen, you, you could work a 6 a.m. shift for years, and getting up at 5 is not the easiest proposition. But there's just something about this week. There's something about this game. There's something about the mood around this town that just kind of has the blood flowing. And it's a whole lot of fun. And I hope you guys have had fun this week. Thanks so much for waking up with us here at 6 a.m. on 97.9 ESPN Radio or streaming over the WTSM app or even the TuneIn Radio app if you have to use that one. The podcast rolls out to a bunch of different places. You probably know what place you listen to it by now. iTunes, Podcast Republic, YouTube, whatever. Thank you so much for doing that. Radio at Warchant.com is your email address. At Wake Up Warchant's your Twitter account. Make sure you're going to both of those or the Tribal Council to submit your questions for tomorrow's mailbag. I believe we're going to have Irish fella Ryan Clark on tomorrow to answer some questions for just a little bit. It's not going to be as long as it's been the last couple of weeks just because, of course, well, we've got a game to play and we've got a game to digest and talk about. So uh, we'll play it by ear on that, but make sure you're sending in those questions there or on the message board. That thread is going to be up just a little bit after we go off the air today. And finally, I have a question. What the heck is going on? That's what I want to know. And and that's an open question. Drew, do you know what the heck is going on? Um, My guess is as good as yours. I I understand where the the root of that question is, but, man, (laughs) I don't know, man. Uh, Some strange things going on. Uh, I don't really know what else to say about it because I I have no insight on it. Listen, and... I think a lot of people think that, you know, to a certain extent, there's an elephant in the room, and there is. And I, I will preface this. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna make anybody upset today. I'm not going to call Florida State out. I'm not going to call any other members of the press out. That's not what we do on this show. We, we, we criticize when people deserve to be criticized. And the thing is, honestly, in this situation, I feel to a certain extent everyone's looking out for their own best interest. And we're going to go moving forward talking about this discussion with that in mind. But that being said, we have to talk about what's going on right now. And that's the fact that, well, practice is pretty much closed. Uh, Some folks are trying to get scoop. You can argue the validity of what they've been doing. You could argue the concern of what they're doing. But to be real with you, you know, some folks... Don't always have editors who understand, hey, practice is closed. And some coaches are, of course, going to retaliate and push back to that. So I'm not here to knock anybody. I'm not here to rip Coach Fisher. I'm not here to rip other members of the media. But let's kind of set up a timeline of what's going on here, if you don't know what I'm talking about. So last Thursday, I believe it was, Florida State comes out and they say that uh, no video of practice. And that's usually the first sign that things are about to get shut down. That's pretty much what happened the year before when things got shut down. Because a lot of people don't remember this, but last season pretty much the same thing happened. Florida State, as soon as game week started, nobody's allowed in those open couple periods. Those two, three, four periods that they open a practice. And even then, it's not the biggest stuff that we see. And we're the first to tell you that on this show, that... For the most part, it's a lot of special teams drills. 
It's a lot of stretching. It's a lot of warm-ups. But what it is is it's also an opportunity to see who's dressed out and who isn't. And you can see that reflected in just about all the practice reports that you'll read anywhere. And, of course, the university trying to protect their injuries, trying to protect all that, in their best interest, isn't a big fan of that. The media, in its best interest of doing their jobs and trying to get info out to the public, are trying to do that. So it makes sense. It's two sides working against each other in the same place in the same goal. One for its privacy and one for, well, the press. One for the press's job to put stuff out there. So that being said, you kind of figured something like this was coming, especially with an opener like Alabama. This isn't ULM. This isn't ULL. So you get the news on Monday after Coach Fisher's press conference. Practice is closed today. Uh, a couple players are going to talk. Cool. Fine. Whatever. That's your prerogative. Tuesday, Coach Fisher cancels his media availability, cancels the players that are supposed to speak, and uh, some press folks waited there for probably about a half hour for that. So I, I understand where everybody's coming from here. And you know what? I'll tell you this. The fact that we're talking about this to start a show on Wednesday of the Alabama game is probably exactly what Coach Fisher wants. This is exactly what they want. Anything to get off the idea of the game that has to be played and Florida State's strategy that has to be employed there is probably a good thing for Florida State. But that's why I've got to do my job and I've got to ask the questions of, why like this? I I, I get it if you want to shut practice down. But the fact is, you can't say, hey, Matthew Thomas is going to be back at practice today. You can't say stuff like that, then completely shut practice down, and you know some people are going to go right to the edges. You can say whether it's valid reporting or not. I'll leave that for you to decide, the listener. But folks hanging out in the parking lot or folks, you know, just trying their best to maybe get a glimpse at who's going into practice and who isn't, when you cut off that access, you can't expect one or two folks to maybe go and stretch that line a little bit and see what's going on there. Those are my personal thoughts on it. I know even some people inside Warchant disagree with me on that. But that's just how I feel about it. Is it ethical? I don't know. I'll leave you to decide that. When it comes to a lot of times when we go to practice, I don't always consider myself the journalist in the group. I'm the guy who hits record on the camera. But I will say this, it's just bad timing for everything, and I get it. I get you want your practice to be private. I get you want an element of surprise and an edge against Alabama, but at the end of the day, don't bring out the story that everybody's been looking for on Monday and then bring no validation to it, and again, that's not me trying to say they're not telling the truth about it either. Because for all I know, they are. But it's just, I just feel like both sides, many folks in the media and maybe sometimes Florida State in this situation, everybody's looking out for their best interests. And when they're doing that and everybody's kind of off on a different page, everybody kind of looks a little strange in the situation. Right. I think what you got to look at here is, you know, something may be going on, something might not be going on. It might be a backlash. It might not be. The speculation could go wherever it wants to go. But at the end of the day, like you said, here we are talking about it and we're not talking about the things that uh, Coach Fisher does or doesn't want us to see. And that's just the end of it. And he's going to everybody knows he's going to run his show the way he wants to run his show. It's always been like that here. He, he's not going to care a whole lot about if the media's feelings are hurt or not. And, you know, at the end of the day, if he feels like this is what's best, then you just have to accept that it's part of everyone's job. It is what it is. Um, now, what now, like you said, what and why? I don't know. Um, we could speculate all day, but no, the, the the real answer is, is nobody has a concrete answer. So we'll just really have to wait and see. Uh, as far as the element of surprise and things of that nature go, you know, just be glad we're not dealing with people like over at Michigan who are releasing a 2017 roster with not a single active player on it. Uh, I mean, the game, we talked about it a little bit yesterday. The game's going on between those two programs about quote-unquote secrecy 
really is laughable. Um, but you know, at least we're not dealing with that. So there's a little perspective for everybody. At least it's not, it hasn't got down to that, uh, that road. I know, I think coach Fisher has something with the ACC network today or something. And I don't think his next it's, media, it's the weekly ACC conference call. Right. So, so members of the media will call into this and it's, it's a way, f- basically how I describe the ACC conference call is it's the best way for visiting media to talk to the opposing coach without having to drive there. That, that's basically what this is. Every coach is going to give a, a quick little statement, and then they're going to field questions from the assembled press from all over the ACC. Then they'll hang up, and the next guy will come on. That's just kind of how it works. Right, and I think so. his next presser technically is, is scheduled for tomorrow then, correct? Thursday, which is typically the injury presser, which is a presser that unless Florida State has a press release out that says this person's hurt, this person's hurt, has to happen. That, that is a thing that has to happen. Right. So at the end of the day, uh, while the sky is falling all over the Twitter sphere and, and all over Florida State fanhood, you just got to wait and see. Um, and you know what? If we're, if we're without some guys, we're without some guys. There's not going to be anything any of us can do about it. I get it. I want to know just as badly as everyone else. But at some point, you just got to, you got to, whatever is out of our control, it's out of our control. It is what it is. There's a very, there's a very big likelihood that you're going to be without a Matthew Thomas, a a D-Jack, and a Trey Marshall for a half. That's a very likely possibility. So maybe go into it expecting that. And the thing is, it's just as likely that Matthew Thomas is wearing number six and he's ready to roll right. when you walk in. Exactly. No one really knows. That's basically what we're trying to say. If you think some, some of us have this inside scoop, we really don't. Uh, like Ryan said, at the very most, people were standing in the parking lot and they saw who walked in and walked out of practice. At the end of the day, that's where it ends. I will. I'll give the university credit, and I'll, I'll give the program credit. People have been pretty, pretty sealed on this one. There, there's not been a lot of things getting out. There was some stuff last week. There was, of course, Jimbo Fisher's statement on his press conference Monday, and outside of that, we really don't know much. That's that's kind of your update, and I hate to update you like that, and I hate to start the show like this on the week that you play Alabama, but. If practice is closed, we don't know a ton of the storylines going on. We don't know a lot of the stuff that's going on inside there because this has been a lot more tight-lipped than usual. I will say that more than anything. So that being said, I don't know who's going to be playing on Saturday. I don't know if Matthew Thomas is okay or not. I want to believe Coach Fisher. I I, want to believe that when a guy says he should be out there practicing today, he's out there practicing that day. But practice closed, and I don't know. So you can take that for what it is. You're only really, for me, it's not even that. My my main concern with him is is we all know that. We know for a fact he hasn't been out of practice. If if he's been there this week, it was he was out for three weeks. Wasn't there for three weeks. So if he has indeed missed two, two, the last two days, which, again, we don't know for sure, um, it, it, it's hard to imagine he would be playing on Saturday. But, again, We have no idea. It is just speculation at this point. All right, folks. You know it's not speculation. The scores that happened last night, they're concrete. They're in the books. Let's talk about that. This is why you're sleeping. Hello. Good morning. Wake up. Wake up. Wake me up. Good morning. Good morning. What happened last night? So we should mention a couple games didn't get played last night due to the rain. Atlanta and Philly didn't get played. Cleveland at the Yankees didn't get played. But Baltimore did host Seattle, and they won 4 to nothing. Washington hosted Miami. They won 8-3. to The Red Sox continued their tear up in Canada. They won 3 to nothing. The Reds drew the Reds 14-4 to Cincinnati over the Metropolitans. Gosh. 12-2. to That's the Texas Rangers against the Houston Astros. That game, of course, being played at the Trop. 10-2, St. Louis over Milwaukee. The Cubbies went at home over the Buccos 4-1. The Twins beat the White Sox 6-4 in Minnesota. 6-2, that's the Kansas City Royals over the Tampa Bay Rays. The Colorado Rockies defeat Matagers 7-3. Arizona over the Los Angeles Dodgers 7-6 in Phoenix. 8-2, that's the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim defeating the Oakland A's at home. And finally, it's the San Diego Padres 6 2 3. 
All right. So that was the hard segment. That's out of the way. We don't have to talk about rumor or anything like that anymore. I do want to talk about something uh, our friend Tony Sakalas wrote on BamaInsider.com about, well, your quarterback, number 12, DeAndre Francois. We got that after this. It's Wake Up War Champ on 97.9 ESPN Radio. got that one out of the way. That's not exactly how I wanted to open the show, but I felt we kind of had to. So that being said, you know, I think it's kind of funny since we've been doing this for a while. And since we've, since I've been in the media, I get asked two things more than just about anything else. And that's, do you have a took, excuse me, do you have a ticket hookup? Which the answer is no, for reasons that are probably obvious from what we discussed in the first segment. And second of all, it's funny, and I think it's because we do college picks here and people hear our thoughts on things. People come up to me and they ask about the Jags a lot. And I, I think it's because, well, for the most part on 97.9, people know Jeff and Tom are the Bucks guys. Drew and I are the Jags guys. That's just kind of how that works. When it comes to talking about pro football, everybody loves to talk about who's got what. You know, you have the Patriots this weekend. Do you have Chicago this weekend? What about Detroit? Well, listen. <laughs> you may have whoever, but if you ask that question, you more than likely already have a thought in mind. If you have a thought in mind, especially for those of you who like to go bet somewhere, go to my bookie. That's what you need to do. Mybookie.ag. They've been in the business for years. Reputation's rock solid. They do 100% cash bonuses. So right off the bat, you're making money for doing nothing. So if you like to bet the NFL, if that's what you think about doing, if that's what you like to do, they have the fast payouts. In just two business days. That's how this works. If you know who's going to win, if that's what you like to do, if that's what you like to do is go out there, lay down some cash, go in big, go have yourself some fun. Of course, do so responsibly. MyBookie.ag is the place to go for that. It's hard to believe as much as we've talked about college football, pro football, man, NFL, it's two weeks. It's a week from tomorrow. And I'm not particularly excited for that Thursday night kickoff game because Kansas City is just not the team that I want to see on opening night. That's just, no. Uh, Just every every bit of unsexy imaginable. But that being said, you have every bit of sexy imaginable on Saturday night when Florida State takes on Alabama. And a lot of that has to do with two dynamic quarterbacks. Say what you want about Jalen Hurts as a downfield passer. He's, well, He's got himself some exciting keys. He's got some things that he can do. Of course, very, very gifted legs, very, very gifted runner. Something that you don't hear a lot about an Alabama quarterback, and we've talked about that before. But DeAndre Francois is the guy that I think, as far as the quarterbacks go, and that's no offense to Jalen Hurts, all eyes are on. And, well, people are starting to realize, and we've talked about this before, how people like to turn out after a team is out of consideration or after a team is out of the title hunt. And I think a lot of people did tune out on Florida State and then tune back in towards the end for that Florida game, for that Michigan game, and they kind of figured it out. This Francois kid's one tough cookie, and he's gotten hit again and again and again and again and again, and he's gotten back up. And I think over the off season is when you've seen a lot of people outside of the FSU bubble kind of realize this is a guy who had to be really tough last year. Our own Tony Sakalas over there at BamaInsider.com, our sister site, did a pretty interesting story about how Alabama has to keep DeAndre Francois on the ground. They have to keep him contained. They have to keep him sacked. They have to impose their will on that offensive line. And that's not rocket science. But when you take a look inside, Tony did a really good job with some of this stuff. It does make you scratch your head when you see something like Anthony Everett saying, quote, Just like any other quarterback that we face in the SEC or anybody we play, we've just got to keep him under control, keep him in the pocket, and can't let him do much. Push that pocket. Which is correct. However, I don't think he's like most quarterbacks you're going to see in the SEC. Because, well, he's got some wheels. 
He's got the ability to make elite throws downfield. He's got way more of a pro-style upside than most of the quarterbacks you're going to see in the SEC. J- Josh Dobbs couldn't do what DeAndre Francois does. Jacob Eason, maybe one day, but right now can't completely do what DeAndre Francois does. Any of the guys at Florida? Yeah, don't think so. Auburn? Jarrett Stidham, maybe, but we don't know about Jarrett Stidham yet. This is a different type of quarterback. This is a better type of quarterback that Alabama is used to going up against. And you saw over the last two national title games what going up against a good quarterback has done to Alabama. It hasn't made their defense terrible all of a sudden. They didn't blink their eyes and become bad. But you can tell it's something that they're not completely used to. And I think that is one thing that Florida State holds an advantage of in this game if the offensive line holds the role. Now, if it's just a sieve and it's a turnstile, then none of this matters. This is completely relevant. But assuming Florida State's offensive line holds its own, assuming Alec Eberle's better, assuming that interior line is as good as people think it can be, and assuming the tackles can just hold their own, assuming Kelly and Leonard can just do what they need to do enough, DeAndre Francois can really be the key to this game. His legs, his mobility, the fact of how much you can do with him, and just the idea of making smart decisions, not turning the ball over. And DeAndre Francois did not turn the ball over a a lot last year. Yeah, I think you saw the last two seasons at least. The recipe for beating Bama is to not try to out-Bama Bama. Bama. You're not going to beat Bama by slamming the ball down their throat. That's just a fact. Um, The running game will play a big part for us, I'm sure, to take some pressure off of Francois. But the way that we're going to have to beat them is we're going to have to throw the football. You saw Clemson do it two years in a row and could have come out with two wins just as easily as it was split. Um, You've seen Ole Miss do it. It's just, it's got to be, it's got to be kind of... I'm thinking Francois is going to have to throw 30 plus times. Um, if not, if not more, I don't know. Um, you want to see guys like Jacquez and Cam Akers get carries, and you will. Uh, but if we're going to beat them, we can't try to slam the ball down their throat because at the end of the day, that front seven's too good. You got too many questions about our O line, and, and, and honestly, that's that's going to be their game plan. That's that's the Bo Scarboroughs. And uh, their big O line, their gra- their grass fed O line. That's what they're gonna do, and it'll be interesting to see what that new offensive coordinator at Alabama does. I expect a lot of of pound from them, and I expect a lot of maybe short passes with every once in a while a deep threat down the field. And that seems to be all reports and indications Alabama is getting back to and getting away from. I guess more a West Coast style, at least what Nick Saban would allow of the West Coast style in his offense away from the, I guess, Pete Carroll era, USC, more than anything. So that being said, Florida State wins games offensively by making you respect everything. You have to respect the little screens. You have to respect the deep ball. You have to respect a run pass option. You have to respect power running it's a pro style offense that adapts a little bit of everything and feeds into a little bit of everything it's mostly run out of a west coast style but that doesn't mean that other trinkets and other things don't get wrinkled in Jimbo Fisher's talked about I don't like run pass options but in today's football I need them especially against Alabama who's been especially weak against them and that's why you need the ability to get Alabama or excuse me get DeAndre Francois out of the pocket and wheel and mobile You need time. He needs time to make those decisions, make those reads, and figure out what's right for that play. Because I'll be honest with you, I think DeAndre Francois' legs play a bigger role in this game maybe than other people think because you've seen it happen over and over again with mobile quarterbacks in Alabama. It's the one thing that they seem to have trouble with. It's sometimes their Achilles heel. Much in the way Florida State sometimes has trouble with up-tempo, They seem to sometimes have trouble with the Chad Kellys, with the Deshaun Watsons, with the Cam Newtons of the world. It's not always something that Alabama seems to have an answer for. Just isn't. So that being said, DeAndre Francois, what do you think is the most important thing for him going into this game? Uh, I think you already brought it up. I I, I think it's being mistake-free as possible, and I think it's trying to stay upright. I think if he he stays upright and he's able to get some time in the pocket and and not – not 
maybe not go out there and try to just not do too much. Um, you know, because we've talked about it many times. It's it's one game that's it's one play that's going to turn this game, and it's going to be a play that either side maybe necessarily doesn't see coming, uh, whether it be special teams or or a fumble, something you can't account for. Um, if you can take care of the football, if you're De- DeAndre Francois and stay upright, um, I think that's going to be your two biggest keys to the game. And and maybe that sounds obvious, but I think I think if you really start Bama's D line to take let them start taking over this game and you get him on the run and uncomfortable and he's just out there slinging and running for his life, that's not a good scenario for Florida State. Well, I think the good news is I don't think we've ever found that line of what uncomfortable is for DeAndre Francois. He's he prepared for this game all last season. If Bama's defensive line does have a little bit of push. That guy was on the ground again and again and again and again. And I don't think that he's going to be on the ground again and again and again and again in this game. At least you hope not. Sacks are going to happen, especially against that front seven. But this is a guy who knows how to take a beating, and he knows how to go down there. And it made me think when we were prepping for this last night, as much talk as there's been about DeAndre Francois getting back up all last season and how much respect it had to bring him from his teammates, it also has to make you think, how much does that annoy an opposing team? Yeah, I mean, you respect it, but how much can that rattle you in that this guy won't stay down? This guy, whatever we do, will not just stay down. He keeps coming back. He keeps coming back. The resiliency of DeAndre Francois is something that could play a big role in, I guess, the mental game, the game behind the ears. And maybe I'm reaching there a little bit. But you have to know when a guy has a big hit on a quarterback, he at least expects him to be gone a couple plays. He expects him, okay, he's on the sideline for a bit. And I'm not trying to say people are out there to hurt or do that, but... A guy gets knocked down, eventually he doesn't get back up. And that was never the case with DeAndre Francois. And here's the thing. It's it's all Francois and, and FSU's hurt all off season, and it's all every other team's hurt all off season. Francois he he's he's as tough as nails. He won't he won't go down, he won't stay down, this and that. So you can expect Bama to be pinning their ears back and coming after him. I think I think if there's one thing for certain in this football game, I expect a lot of heavy blitz packages coming from Bama uh at Francois. Biggest key on offense before we go. What 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 do you think? Hmm. Biggest key. Uh, I would say, God, that's a good question. It is a it is a good because we don't know. Um, Be, because period. You you've heard great things about Keith Gavin. You've heard great things about Jacquez Patrick, but this offense is going to look completely different except that man under center, and that's why it's so important that he has a good game. Yeah, I, I, obvious. I I I think the key really on offense is just protecting the football, and I, I just you can't you can't afford to give Bama those extra possessions in this game. You really can't. And I, I think you need to be able to stretch the field, but at the same time keep your balance. Uh, like I said, I, I I think to win this football game, DeAndre Francois has to throw thirty to thirty five plus. I really believe that. I think you saw Deshaun Watson do it. You've seen Chad Kelly do it. All the teams who give Bama problems, uh, the quarterback plays a predominant role in that by throwing a lot a lot a lot so yep. i expect i expect to be able to stretch the field uh keep them keep them upright and and play as turnover free as possible you have a yardage number in mind um no i'm not i'm not gonna put that on them i I'm not, uh, i don't know it's got to be over 300 i think that's what i'd say well when we play over under on Friday with Gene Williams, I'm I would assume 300 is probably that number. I'll, I'll go ahead and set that number for you right now. 300 yards is maybe going to be the indicator of how good does his passing attack look? How much time does DeAndre Francois have? That's just kind of the way the cookie crumbles against one of the best defenses historically in college football and one of the greatest runs for over a decade the Nick Saban's defense has had. When we come back, it's more FSU Alabama talk. Wake up, Fortune, 97.9 ESPN Radio. Yes! 
Florida State just landed a five-star commitment. I don't see that anywhere online. How did you get that news so fast? I'm on the new Warchant.com app. I get news updates and scores pushed to my phone instantly. How much does it cost? It's free. Just go to iTunes or the Google Play Store, type in Warchant, and install it on your phone. That's it. A free app that keeps me constantly up to date on Florida State sports and recruiting? Wow, that makes it incredibly easy to follow my Seminoles and never miss out. With the app, you'll also get quick access to all the stories and features on Warchant, including the ever-popular message boards that feature thousands of fans talking about the Knowles. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole source. Welcome back to Wake Up Board Champ, brought to you by your friends at For the Table, Madison Social, Central Allen Township, all there in the heart of College Town. Speaking of which, it's Wednesday. It's a Winstein Wednesday, which means if you head on over to Township, you're going to get yourself a full liter of beer for half price. This week, it's Proof 850, so make sure you're headed on over there tonight. It's always a good time, and of course, the best happy hour in town, 4 to 7, and that's not just a Township. That's at Madison Social and Central as well, so... It's so midweek. It's about that time. Getting a little ready for that game. Maybe heading on over there. Just watching some preseason football because we don't have more college just yet. We get that tomorrow. Speaking of which, we've got two really good Thursday games. So Madison Social is another good place to go watch those. If you want to wet your whistle with a little bit of Ohio State and Indiana. If you want to maybe take in a little NC State, South Carolina. That game's either going to be great or that game's going to be awful. That's how I kind of feel about that one. I think Ohio State and Indiana, Indiana, it's all going to be, can Indiana hang? Because Indiana hung a lot last year. They were around with a lot of good teams and never really pulled the trigger on it. But North Carolina State, South Carolina, Dave Dorn, people really don't know what to think about him. South Carolina supposed to be better, but Will Muschamp still the coach there. You, I mean, you just kind of grit your teeth a little and you think, uh, who knows? I mean, there's been a lot of chatter around NC State this offseason. A lot people of people love that D line, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they really do. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how they do, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb here. If they struggle with South Carolina, things aren't as good as people people thought they were because I'm with you. Uh, Will Muschamp, um, God bless him. Well, he, 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 he likes to go into programs and just kind of hit the destruction button a little bit is what it seems. God love them, folks. God love them. But if you're not headed to that game on Saturday, by the way, Madison Social, Central, Township, those are all great places to go watch said game. Sound's going to be pumped throughout College Town. It's going to be a great atmosphere there on Madison Street. So make sure you're with our friends at For The Table. There's been so much talk about the 2007 game. We talked about it at the beginning of this week. The ACC Digital Network, I know, did a little highlights package of it. Ira Chaffel has a piece on Warchant.com right now, not just about that, but about some of the guys from that 2007 game and beyond who are going to be at this game. This is going to be a who's who of Florida State Seminoles are going to be at this game. But that kind of got me thinking, not necessarily about the 2007 game, the game that did happen, but the game that didn't. And I know Jalen Ramsey even tweeted something out to that effect yesterday. That 2013 game that everybody just knew was going to happen. Florida State and Alabama, a kick six later, isn't what everybody wanted. And that's not to say you're disappointed in the national title. But in the moment, let's not act like there weren't a lot of sad people that Florida State didn't get to play Alabama. Now, I think we maybe ended up getting a better game because Auburn's defense, even though it was not highly touted throughout that season, was maybe better suited to deal with what Florida State does because there was a lot of talk that year about Alabama's secondary is the weakness of their defense and Florida State's strength is its passing game. So a lot of people didn't really think that that matchup went well. Of course, that was the only matchup that Vegas said Florida State would not have been favored in. But I think it's, to a certain extent, a shame we didn't get it. But at the same time, you cannot, especially if you're a Florida, if you're anybody but an Auburn fan, honestly, you cannot be disappointed with the result you got in that 2013 national title game. And I think the thing about that Bama game for me, I just remember when I realized we were going to play Auburn, and this may sound crazy to a lot of people, 
but Auburn made me a lot more nervous, other than the fact that Alabama's Nick Saban, because I'll, I'll tell you, that that's obviously terrifying to, in, a, in a national title matchup. Um, the Auburn team made me a lot more nervous because I had a lot, a lot of confidence in that defense in 2013, as well as obviously Jameis Winston and company. But Auburn's offense was so tricky and so, you know, it, it was just scary to me. And um, I thought it was going to give us a lot of issues, and, and it clearly did. Uh, obviously, we came out with the win in that game, but I just thought I just thought if it was a more conventional type approach, I really just didn't see that 2013 team losing to anyone. I mean, they were so good. And maybe that's just me being spoiled and how that year went and, and being biased. But I'm telling – other than, like I said – other than the factor of you have to beat Nick Saban in a national title game, which is near impossible, uh, but it's it's been done recently. Um, you know, that just, I don't know. I wanted Bama. I really did because I thought that was going to be, I thought that would have been the, the way to really overall prove your dominance because, look, at the end of the day, people aren't, aren't going to say, well, Florida State missed that Auburn team in the national title game. Whoever really knows if they had to beat them. It's always, well, Florida State didn't quite get Bama because of that kick six, and that would have been the game we all wanted to see. When the kick six happened, the first thing that went in my mind was, dear God, not Mizzou. I don't know why. I just had that terrible feeling about that Missouri team that had really caught fire at the end of the year, was playing really, really strong, and that was, oh gosh, what's the name? I'm having a brain fart here. Wide receiver that transferred to Oklahoma that played for Mizzou that was so good. Doriel Green Beckham. Doriel Green Beckham. I about said Doriel Beckham Green, but yeah, Doriel Green Beckham. That guy was really good, and I think people underestimate college football will never give, especially because he was always kind of a second fiddle in a Big 12 and then never ended up pulling the trigger in those SEC title games they were. Gary Pinkle was a really good coach. And the fact that he was able to do what he did at Missouri now, at Missouri, you just kind of had to sit back and respect it. But as soon as the kick six happened, it wasn't either team in the SEC that was on my mind. I just kind of rubbed my hands together and thought, you know, Florida State looks like they're going to win a national championship. And who better to send Florida State back out of the gutter and be on the receiving end of a beatdown than Urban Meyer. It was Ohio State all the way for me. I knew they had to win that Big Ten game. They had to. So we could get FSU, OSU, Jimbo versus Urban, because the only other time that's happened, it didn't work out so pretty for Urban Meyer. And it was the game that, you know, you just kind of wring your hands a little bit and you think to yourself, oh, yeah, wait, wh- what do you mean? Michigan State? Really? Ugh. fine, I guess we'll play Auburn. And I, I don't want that to sound disrespectful, but let's be honest. A month before that, people had no idea what to think of Auburn. And then two amazingly crazy plays later, they're in the national championship. Right. And it was the perfect narrative too, right? It was this completely unstoppable force versus this team of destiny. And we heard that for a month, didn't we? Well, now... You get Florida State and Alabama, and you get unstoppable force versus immovable object, and you have a little bit of fun with it. Yeah, I mean, good Lord. I was so tired of hearing Team of Destiny, iron sharpens iron. We haven't been – Florida State hasn't been in a fourth-quarter contest since Boston College and this and that. And, you know, when we were down 21-3, to I thought, ugh, I really hope I didn't fly across the country to watch us get whooped. But – um, you know what? I'm glad it happened because it made the game that much better. So, And I'll say this. The iron sharpens iron argument, yeah, it got really tired. It got really old really fast. But the team of Destiny one, you really couldn't refute it until they finally lost that game, until they finally stubbed their toe a second time to a team not named LSU early on. Did it ever seem like they were going to lose a stinking game? That's because there was multiple multiple te- uh, games that year where they just pulled it. Uh, the Georgia game especially, I was about obviously. To say, and, and it wasn't just those two. I mean, you could say that a little bit about that SEC title game where they just got, you know, a nice play here, a nice play there. Everything seemed to happen for them, right place, right time. And I know sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, and sometimes it's better to be good than lucky. But it just seemed like it wasn't going to stop for them. 
And when you're a dominant team like Florida State was, and you looked at a game like Auburn instead of Alabama, which is what you thought was going to happen for, let's face it, for a good six weeks of that college football season, especially after Oregon lost to Stanford. When that happened on that Thursday night in the barn, everybody just kind of thought, this is a foregone conclusion who's going to play each other. This is a collision course. And when that changed, there was that inevitable disappointment. And that's nothing against Auburn and that's nothing against the job they did that year it was a fun team to watch and let's talk about the the uh, when we talk about you know big spreads that Auburn Florida State game had a big big spread if I remember correctly I want to say it was almost 10 points if not 10 uh Florida State I think I I know it was at the very least a possession it was it was not like a three-point spread right it it was a big spread I mean we've talked about the Alabama spread a lot a lot and then we're talking about a national title game I'm not 100% sure, but I want to say it was up near 10 points, but don't don't quote me on that. I, I'm pulling that up for you right now. And Florida State versus Auburn, according to Odd Shark, who archives all that stuff. Odd Shark predicted it 49-35 Florida State, but I'm trying to find the line here. Uh, Florida State opened as a six-and-a-half point favorite in that game. So it was right around a touchdown. Okay, so not 10, but still pretty big for a national title game. You saw it with Clemson and Alabama as well. And speaking of which, before we go to break, because I know we got to wrap this up here, Auburn coming into that game was 4-1 and against the spread in their past five, five bowl games, and they'd won outright two times as an underdog of their last, of nine or more points. So there was a thought that, they could do it because they spurned Vegas before. But I did want to issue a correction talking about Vegas spreads yesterday. I said that Florida State was 2-0 and on a neutral field as a dog under Jimbo Fisher. I was wrong because I just so happened to forget about a 2014 Rose Bowl game against Oregon where they were an eight-point dog, and that didn't work out. So, well, sorry. We're putting a bow on it after this. Wake up, board chant, 97.9 ESPN Radio, brought to you by our friends at For the Table. Here, Wake Up War Chant, 97.9 ESPN Radio. We were talking off the air. Gosh, that 2013 team was, of course, undefeated. And was 11-2 and two against the spread going into that national title game? You looked that up because you wanted to know that line? Yeah, it was 11-2 and two against the spread. That line got all the way up to almost 9. I think it sat at like 8.5 by January 2nd. Um, but it did open at 6.5, which it just isn't an absolutely huge line for a national title game. And the fact that the public moved it that much is what's kind of insane to think about. I wonder who those two games were that they didn't. It was probably, I know Wake, probably, or not Wake, excuse me. Boston College, like you said. Yeah, Boston College, sorry. I was trying to think. Which small school did they get down to? Oh, yeah, BC. It wasn't Maryland because they blew Maryland out of the water. It wasn't Clemson. It wasn't Florida. I don't think it was Miami. Would it have been that I'm a... It might have been. It might have been Florida. It was because that was thirty-seven-seven. What was, oh no, the spread was twenty-eight and a half for that game. I think. So I'm it wasn't impressed Florida. you remember that because you did not have a computer in front of you. For I that hate I Florida. Think. I remember all that stuff. <laughs> it might have been that NC State game because remember they scored thirty-five in that first quarter, and then FSU just took their foot way off the gas, and NC State scored a couple late. That might have been. Who cares? Anyway, before we run, because I know we've got like five seconds. Giancarlo Stanton hit his 18th homer of August. Eight, have you ever thought heard of anything like that, especially in a non-steroid era? No, it's it's the balls, though. The balls are all juiced up now. I'm telling you. They got different baseballs. That's why there's more home runs this year. It's a conspiracy, Paul. It's a straight conspiracy. Thanks for listening to Mike and Mike's up next. 97.9 ESPN Radio. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. 
Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source. Hey, thanks for downloading today's show. If you haven't already, uh, why don't you rate and subscribe us? We certainly do appreciate it, and of course, we appreciate you listening anyway, so just go ahead and click that right there. You know you want to. Come on. Come on. Thanks again for letting us do the show. We love giving you all the football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, all year round. Not just football season, not just spring practice, but hopefully giving you the freshest and newest FSU content every day. Thanks, guys.